Thanks, Matt. That was an amazing um, introduction to the network. And thank you so much for uh, having me this afternoon. I'm just going to share my screen before we get started. Has that worked? Is that fine? And Amelia, if you just give me a, a five minute reminder when I should be wrapping up the presentation, that would be really um, appreciated. <laughs> It's so great to um, come and present to the Queer Family Violence Sector ne Network today. Um, I've had a long history with uh, Rainbow Health back in the day when it was Gay and Lesbian Health Victoria. So I'm always so happy to come and support the work that they do um, and be part of um, a network like this. Um, before I start the presentation today, I just want to make my own acknowledgement of country to say that I'm uh, coming from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations and to pay my part, uh, respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to all uh, members of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander community who may be present today and also recognise the struggles of our sister girls and our brother but uh, brother boys and members of the LGBTIQ community who come from our First Nations uh, communities across Australia. Uh, being a, a legal professional, it's always at the, the forefront of our minds when we're working in terms of the impact that colonisation and the, uh, the impact of over-policing and the horrendous incarceration rates for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people uh, when we do our work. And we, we are hoping that we will be part of the change uh, that our country needs. All right, I'm going to get straight into the presentation. Today I'm really focused on what the LGBTIQ legal service does and how we're structured and what the family violence uh, program offers uh, the community in terms of legal assistance and education. At the end of the session, I would really love to hear uh, people's input in terms of what kind of training or further information that they would like in regards to understanding uh, some of the complexities in terms of supporting LGBTIQ people impacted by family violence who may be interacting with the legal system or seeking protection or responding to those kind of applications. Um, I would be very grateful to hear your input. So who are we? We're part of uh, the St Kilda Legal Service. We've been around for over 40 years. Um, St Kilda has quite an activist history. We have always worked very closely with the sex worker communities and do uh, um, alcohol and drug outreach as part of our uh, legal services. And we've come about in terms of developing this specific program in terms of recognising a community need in terms of uh, the clients that we were seeing coming to our service uh, who identified as LGBTIQ and the need to develop a specific service that could provide informed and safe uh, legal responses uh, to their needs. We're a, state, we're a free statewide um, organisation, even though we do sit within uh, St Kilda Legal Service. What I thought I would um, start with before we talk about uh, our specific program is to have a little bit of a discussion about who the community legal assistance sector is. So we, the legal assistance sector is really a combination of both community legal centres as well as Victoria Legal Aid. We provide generally free and holistic legal services to people who we either identify as being marginalised or vulnerable members of the community. Uh, each uh, community legal centre or legal aid provide a different form of assistance, but generally our services are designed to ensure that we're addressing both the legal needs as well as identifying the non-legal issues that may be affecting our clients' lives. So it's really important to us as lawyers to ensure that we've got strong partnerships and connections with non um, legal services, as well as an understanding of the local area that we're working with, or the particular concerns in terms of the community or target population that our legal services are seeking to address. 
The legal assistance sector is renowned for developing innovative legal responses. So we're aiming to provide legal initiatives to meet the needs and involve people who may not otherwise uh, identify that they have legal issues or actively seek out legal assistance. So a lot of our initiatives um, are formed through health justice partnerships, where we partner with a non-legal service to provide either a really um, significant referral pathway or provide by providing legal assistance in non-legal settings. Um, and all of this is to ensure that we are identifying early intervention strategies that can reduce the, the impact um, and, and the legal consequences of some of the issues that our clients have. Uh, finally, the legal assistance sector is strongly committed to systemic advocacy and law reform. Um, and part of our work is always about thinking about how we can increase the evidence base to address our community's legal needs, but also to advocate for legal and policy changes that may be affecting our clients. So why specific LGBTIQ legal services? So why we feel the need to have a specific LGBTIQ legal service um, for our community is to ensure that we're providing trauma-informed and safe services. We're addressing the impact of both historic and continuing experiences of marginalisation and discrimination, um, both on the basis of um, our community's LGBTIQ status, but as well as as well as um, in relation to the impact upon how the community and the legal system and other institutions that our community has interacted, interacted with in terms of how they valued our identity and community. And these kind of barriers that uh, we, we've identified and we understand has affected the legal outcomes for many LGBTIQ people uh, continue to exist, even though we have large amounts of law reform and inclusion within uh, legislation and legal systems and specific programs like ours and others that exist within the police, it doesn't mean that our community aren't continuing to experience those barriers. Um, an important part of um, ensuring that we have specific legal services is ensuring that we are responding to the intersectional um, impacts of marginalisation and discrimination that many of our community members experience and how they can impact their legal issues and the way that they would address the legal system or access the legal system. We're one of four specific uh, legal services or programs across Australia. So there's one locally, um, the Fitzroy Legal Service have a health justice partnership with Drummond Street, um, who provide primarily family violence and family law assistance. In Sydney, there's a trans and gender diverse legal service, as well as an LGBTIQ legal advice uh, program coming out of that legal centre. And in Queensland, there's the LGBTI uh, legal service that's based in Brisbane and provides a, a whole range of um, legal advice and assistance to uh, the community across Queensland. Okay. In terms of identifying the legal needs of the LGBTI community, there's very little research to identify what are the legal needs of the LGBTIQ community. We know some basic factors that are influencing the way that uh, the community is seeking legal assistance from services such as ours and mainstream legal services. And we understand from our research within the community that most of the community, so 80%, in regards to our legal needs analysis have identified that they would rather uh, uh, rather access an LGBTIQ specific service than a mainstream service for a whole range of different reasons. And our work within the legal sector over the time during COVID has really, uh, I, I think, increased the um, 
the desire for members of our community to be able to access LGBTIQ specific services, both in relation to responses to family violence as well as in regard to their legal needs. We'll talk a little bit more um, in the presentation about access and reporting rates uh, when we focus on the LGBTIQ family violence program. Okay, so our service, it was established in 2018, it was originally a health justice partnership with Thorn Harbour Health. So in that um, service, we were responding to all legal needs that the, um, the clients of Thorn Harbour Health were um, identifying. So it was a really broad spectrum in terms of what kind of legal assistance we were giving uh, Thorn Harbour Health's clients. In 2019, we received some funding to establish the Roberta Perkins program, uh, project, which was developed in partnership with Transgender Victoria. That's our trans and gender diverse uh, specific legal program. Out of that program, while it too was quite a generalist uh, legal service, we developed quite a specialist um, expertise in terms of advocating for trans and gender diverse people who are in prison across Victoria and it's become quite a focus in terms of that work which is extended to a partnership with Flat Out um, and uh, connection with Whit Gorey who does a lot of uh, volunteer advocacy with tra uh, trans people who are currently incarcerated. So while those two programs are no for, not formally continuing in the service, we continue to work closely with LGBTIQ um, organisations as well as other legal stakeholders. Um, the importance of making that connection and continuing that connection with LGBTIQ specific and controlled um, services is to ensure that we're um, enabling the voices and the experiences and input of both community members as well as those services who specifically work with our community um, in terms of the work that we're doing and the future direction that we take. Uh, this year, the service will be developing its first advisory committee. Uh, this committee, be, committee will um, form the basis of, I guess, community input from both experts and community members alike in terms of guiding the direction and continued connection um, in terms of the work that our service will be doing. Uh, in relation to the specific uh, focus that our new strategic uh, plan has identified. As I mentioned, we've just developed our first strategic plan for the service in terms of um, going from partnerships with organisations that provided really a, a generalist overview of legal issues to providing far more targeted legal assistance. Um, so it enables our lawyers to specialise in particular um, legal expertise. Our first priority group is again, the trans and gender diverse uh, community. So we recognise that this community has um, a lot of specific legal needs and specific barriers that have affect um, many people's ability to access legal assistance um, and often quite complex needs in those legal, legal issues. So in terms of this strand of work, we're working with the trans and gender diverse community to address any issue, legal issue, that may be particularly affected by either their sexual or gender identity. So it still needs to lead um, to have uh, a connection with that person's LGBTIQ status. The second main area of work that the service um, has been developing over the last sort of 12 to 18 months is the LGBTIQ Family Violence Program. So our priority group is to work with LGBTIQ people impacted by family violence. 
The aim of the work is to prevent or reduce experiences of family violence within the LGBTIQ community. However, the wording of who and how we work with people is very specific. We're not working with people who um, only identify as, as victim survivors. Um, we, the program is open to all people impacted by family violence. And the reason for that is that we one, recognise the very high predominance of and the complexity within misidentified uh, family violence matters that are being heard within the uh, family violence legal system throughout Victoria. But also we recognise the, um, regardless of uh, who you are or where you sit within that um, particular legal issue, we recognise that for all LGBTIQ people, there are really specific barriers um, in terms of accessing the legal system to address family violence. And so we want to ensure that our service is open to be able to support all members of the community. The final uh, priority group in the legal service is, is wanting to capture a slightly more generalist approach to the work that we're doing, if it is still really targeted in how we're working with the community. So this is a stream of legal assistance that seeks to assist anyone who has experienced discrimination, harassment or violence on the basis of their sexual or gender identity. So that in terms of the difference between the other two clinics, uh, other two streams is that these experience may uh, involve discrimination law, it may involve employment law, it may look at personal safety intervention orders, so, um, you know, violence outside a family context. Um, and it also may involve, say, victims com victim compensation claims or complaints in relation to how uh, people have been, you know, privacy breaches or other factors that in, are inherent, inherent in experiences of harassment by our community members. Okay, right. So before I talk about the family violence uh, program that we've established in the legal service, I just wanted to touch on what many of you will already know, but are the statistics in regards to both reporting family violence to services, but also within the legal system. And we'd just like to acknowledge that these statistics have come from the Private Lives Survey number three, um, <laughs> that Rainbow Health has had quite a lot to do with in terms of giving us the this fantastic evidence base that many of us in terms of education and advocacy rely on often. So, you know, while we, you know, we're, we're very well aware that many LGBTIQ people don't report family violence to anyone or services, for us what we're really concerned about is the lack of people, community members who are reporting family violence to lawyers or in the legal system or the court system. So in that uh, work, and I can't remember the amount of people that these statistics came from, but it was several thousand, 2.5% of people who'd experience family violence actually spoke about it to a legal representative or access a legal system or the courts to address family violence, which is really significant. And the other aspect, of course, is looking at the 5.9% at who reported to the police or the gay and lesbian um, liaison officers. <laughs> So whenever I do this work, whether it's in terms of the legal assistance sector or the family violence response sector, you know, we are constantly talking about cultural change. So while, um, you know, our service is here to respond to legal inquiries, we're also here to be part of that cultural change and to identify ways where we can turn around these statistics and increase people's ability to want to seek legal protections, both know that they can and, and how the legal system will work to support them doing that, as well as being able to openly talk to, you know, the police or gay and lesbian liaison officers, if that's the kind of protection that they're seeking. Yeah. So 
just as an overview, I go through in more detail with each of these. Um, what the Family Violence Program is providing is a targeted legal clinic, and I'll talk about that in more, more detail. So it's a weekly clinic where um, LGBTIQ people from all over the state can access the service. We also provide a targeted community legal education uh, program, and I'll talk in more detail about that and are heavily involved in systemic advocacy, both in terms of uh, law reform, as well as the implementation of the Royal Commission recommendations that um, in regards to family violence. Finally, we provide a service for secondary consultations for both family violence response uh, workers, as well as lawyers and other people involved in the legal system. So this enables us to give sort of an expert advice to people who are assisting LGBTIQ clients, either in terms of the um, accessing response services or seeking assistance through the legal system. So our legal clinic. <laughs> so our legal clinic um, focuses on family violence related matters. So it's not just resti restricted to people who are seeking assistance in regards to either responding to an intervention order or seeking protection. It also includes any other family violence related matter. Um, as long as we have capacity to undertake um, that particular work. So there are lots of specific schemes that, are, um, that relate to family violence legal issues, such as exceptions around the, the tenancy laws, if someone's experienced family violence in their, ten uh, in their rental property, or the, um, the fines, sorry, the family violence fine system, if someone's um, experienced, uh, sorry, if someone's had a fine that can be directly related to their experience of family violence. Um, we also do VOCAD applications. So when people are seeking uh, compensation to assist them in terms of healing and recovering from experiences of family violence. So when you think of this clinic, it's not just intervention orders. There's lots of other legal issues that are related to the experience of family violence. Okay, so what we you know, are aiming to do in the legal clinic is to provide that early intervention advice and information. This is really important and key in terms of the message that I want the family violence response uh, practitioners to, to take away is that when referring clients to our service, it can simply be to receive advice and information on the family violence legal system. So there's no obligation for those clients to then be going to court and seek, seeking remedies. It can be simply to get legal advice on what is the um, legally recognised as family violence and what are your rights when you're in that particular situation. So a lot of um, people, when they think of accessing a legal service, they, you know, they're, they're quite hesitant to disclose this information to lawyers. They assume there's an expectation it may result in going to court or, um, you know, the police getting involved in, in their matters. You know, for us, providing community members with legal advice is part of that cultural change. It's part of breaking down the barriers in terms of accessing the legal system. It's getting to know how to, um, you know, what a community legal centre is, how to, how to talk to a lawyer, you know, the fact that hopefully they're not too intimidating. And also, if in the future, because we understand the dynamic in terms of family violence, it may be quite a journey before leaving that relationship or seeking protections if in the future they want to access legal assistance or to, to get an intervention order or to speak to the police they're more informed and empowered in terms of how they can do that. The clinic also provides ongoing legal casework, so it's not just once off information and advice um, and that can cover a whole range of issues. Um, we also provide limited legal representation and intervention order hearings. So while we've had COVID, we've had the increased reliance on, um, what do we call them, WebEx links, so like 
basically Zoom calls into the court, which has really assisted us to be able to represent clients all over Victoria. So we've had quite a few uh, matters in regional Victoria where we've been able to represent those clients um, through the video links, which has made it a far more effective statewide service. In terms of legal representation for family violence intervention order hearings, um, we are generally focused on representing people who have been uh, misidentified in intervention order matters. And part of the reason for that is because they have, that's the predominant work that's coming into our clinic. Um, so we do, in that case, we are representing a lot of respondents um, and that legal representation, that involves the negotiation with the police and the ongoing, um, I guess, uh, managing of that legal issue for those clients. Uh, what else did I want to say about that? I wanted to say something else. Maybe it'll come back to me later. Yes, no, what I wanted to say is that we also represent people who have uh, what we call affected family members in police intervention order applications. So the police may have made an application for an intervention order um, against our client's partner or ex-partner. That application is the application of Victoria Police. The person who um, is obtaining the protection from that intervention order should always have their own legal representation. So the police represent their interest and what they want to see happen. But how our legislation has been drafted and the system works is that the affected family member, so the person who's been identified as the victim or the, uh, the victim survivor in the situation, their views should be central in terms of how the court considers their response in terms of those applications. So please don't think that, um, please consider uh, referring your clients who are affected family members in police intervention order applications. So we also provide inclusive and safe legal and non-legal statewide referrals. So part of our work is developing those statewide networks in terms of accessing appropriate support services. As I mentioned, we're holistic lawyers. You know, we're experts in family violence and we understand that the best thing for our clients is to be supported by a family violence case manager. So that's continual work for us. We've developed um, resources to assist our clients and also so um, legal professionals assisting um, LGBTIQ clients in the family violence intervention order lists. And that will be an ongoing piece of work to identify who are the services that provide an informed and safe, safe response for our clients. So referrals are primarily coming through community partners. And I think that's a really important uh, consideration to note. So when we looked, when we think about the statistics that we talked about a little bit earlier, there is a huge resistance in our community to will, you know, um, access both family violence services and the legal system on their own accord. So uh, most of our uh, client referrals in this clinic are coming from our key partner relationships, whether they're mental health services, Thorn Harbour Health, uh, Rainbow Door, and of course the NJC LGBTIQ practitioner service as well. Okay, so community legal education. So another large aspect of the family violence program is to provide community legal education in relation to the experiences of family violence by members of the LGBTIQ community. There's really um, what's become very apparent very quickly is we're providing very different types of education to specific parts of our, um, I guess, our, our community, whether it's uh, legal or non-legal services. So in terms of lawyers, we're providing informed advocacy training in how to provide holistic services to LGBTIQ people impacted by family violence. So that looks at how to use the legislation, what are the important parts to go through in terms of um, your client's awareness of what is family violence, how to make submissions in court, what the, the expectation of the magistrate's knowledge in terms of LGBTIQ family 
family violence. So there are resources that the magistrates rely on and we know what they are. So training in how to use those um, to, to, to get the most effective outcome for your clients. And then of course, ensuring that they're linked in to LGBTIQ specific services for ongoing support. In terms of the family violence response sector, our training is quite different in terms of whether it's LGBT, their LGBTIQ specific services. So often when we're working with these services, we're providing family violence legal education. So a far more informed and in-depth understanding of what it means to access that system and what it will look like for the services that they're supporting. And at each stage, what are the specific um, support services that are available through the courts or um, through the, the legal assistance sector or through the family violence response sector, which, you know, they're part of, of course. Um, and then the other side is training mainstream family violence response services while still providing that legal education, having a far greater focus on what uh, case studies of our clients' experiences of, of accessing the legal system, um, really breaking down how misidentification and the kind of myths around mutual violence are being per perpetuated by um, the police and other parts of the legal system um, to really give them, I guess, a best practice strategy in terms of how to support LGBTIQ people who are interacting with the legal system. Um, other resources that the LGBTIQ legal service has have developed in the past have been an LGBTIQ inclusive practice toolkit for legal services. So part of that work um, has looked at developing a transition policy, a dead name policy and how to um, work with your clients when having to go through uh, conflict checks and provide a safe and sensitive service uh, when having to go through those processes. Um, this is a toolkit that we're aiming to do more work with and hoping to work in collaboration with other legal assistance services throughout the sector. Um, I don't know if any of the community legal centres in Victoria have undertaken a rainbow tick and maybe Matt or anyone else could, um, could clarify that point for me. It's we are very small services, we have very few resources. So, you know, we have advocated repeatedly for the government to give us funding to support legal service, legal community legal centres, sorry, um, undertake the rainbow tick or, or equivalent LGBTIQ inclusion uh, training on a more rigorous and I guess um, rigorous and consistent form but without that added those added resources it's quite difficult for our sector to engage um, with, with mechanisms like that. So where, you know, the, the, there's a group of CLCs emerging in Victoria that are really keen to do this work. So, you know, part of our role is to really encourage that leadership um, and, you know, work with other community legal services to support each other in terms of improving the experiences of LGBTIQ people accessing the legal system. The other part of the work that we do in this space is developing legal resources, both for community members, legal practitioners and non-legal non services. So we have quite a few pro bono partners who um, provide in all, like generous, generous um, assistance to us in terms of developing these resources. Um, and that will be a continuing piece of work that we do. Uh, and, and really hoping that this will form part of the inclusive practice toolkit that we continue to develop, to develop over the next 12 to 18 months. Finally, um, systemic advocacy. So if anyone's involved in an LGBTIQ specific service, you're inherently, you understand that um, we're very often um, approached by both government and 
um, non-government organisations to be involved in uh, systemic advocacy and law reform initiatives. Um, there are too many <laughs> for me to uh, put down in a slide this afternoon and go through. So I thought um, instead of putting uh, in the initiatives that we're involved in, I would put uh, in the organisations that we're working with to address some of the, the legal reforms and also the family violence response initiatives um, that we're providing input in terms of their development. Um, one of the, the tenets of this service is to ensure that we're able to advocate for the experiences of our clients and what we're learning in terms of what um, the experiences and some of the continuing barriers are for our community when accessing the legal service, especially in relation to family violence. And so that becomes a really important part of our work in terms of engaging in systemic advocacy. Um, a lot of our work has been centred around the specialist family violence courts, as well as the emerging work that's happening for the police courts and legal services around the predominance of misidentification and also the emerging, I guess, interest in the criminalisation of coercive control. Um, some of the work, as I mentioned earlier, that has arisen out of our, um, our service has been the advocacy around uh, trans, trans and gender diverse um, people's experience um, of, in, of while being incarcerated, uh, specifically relating to their trans and gender diverse identity. Uh, some of the other work that we've been involved in, uh, which more strongly relates to your sector, has been the development of the MARAM tools and how they um, are being developed specifically in regards to looking at LGBTIQ experiences of family violence. And there's quite a few others, but I'll leave it, I'll leave it at that. Okay. So finally. Um, in terms of referring to our servants, the information that we require is the name and date of birth of the client and the other party involved in the legal issue. So sometimes there might not be another party, but usually there is. Um, it's, it's not necessary, like you can refer without that information and we can contact the client uh, to find out what that information is, but it's incredibly useful. The reason why we need that information is to ensure that we undertake a conflict check. So a conflict check is really quite specific in regards to legal services. It's to ensure that we have the ability to provide legal assistance to that client. If we hold information um, about uh, the other party that would be seen to, I guess, give us an unfair advantage in representing our client, that's when um, we would consider that we have a conflict and the client would need to be referred elsewhere. So it's never a guarantee when you refer clients to our service that we will be able to represent them. Um, explaining what a conflict check is, is incredibly difficult. Um, even though I've been a lawyer for many years, I, I still cannot, I, it's so difficult to do without breaching someone's privacy. So I can't tell them that, sorry, your ex-partner is currently accessing our service to get legal advice with their fines or something like that. So it can be um, quite difficult for clients who had an expectation that they would automatically get assistance from us. We also, of course, we're uh, requesting the client's contact details, but we also request any relevant safety information to assist in terms of how we do contact our client. Just remembering that, you know, we are dealing primarily with issues related to family violence or other experiences of discrimination and violence that our clients um, may have experienced and we don't know um, who the other party is or how safe they are to, to discuss those issues. So it's really important that we have that information. 
as I noted earlier, uh, we have a policy that um, We've developed a policy and we'll be doing training in the legal assistance sector in regards to how to ask for uh, clients' previous legal names. So we've got a professional um, obligation, a legal obligation to have to ask our clients uh, to disclose all previous legal names. And that comes back to having to undertake that conflict check. Um, so as you can imagine for many of our clients both trans and gender diverse as well as other members of the lgbtiq community this can be quite a um, a sensitive issue um, and it's you know if you're referring clients to our service it um, it might be useful to have a discussion that this may be something that's required to disclose when accessing uh, the legal service So, do I have more time, Amelia? Have I raced through that? Or am I on time? I do. You've done very well. You've got uh, eight minutes left, Hillary. Oh, eight minutes left. Okay. Oh, no. I was, <laughs> these are our contact details and I'll leave them up for um, everyone to see. So, it's quite a limited intake time. Um, it's on Monday, Wednesday and Friday afternoons. I think the, um, I was going to include a slide in terms of the experiences of what we're seeing in the family violence clinic at the moment. So I've talked a lot around misidentification today. And so that's where um, we're able to identify uh, that the person who is a respondent to an intervention order is actually the person who has been experience the, experiencing the abuse from a partner. So uh, this is a, a phenomena within our family violence um, legal system um, and something that I've been involved in addressing outside an LGBTIQ context. Um, however, that added complexity of an LGBTIQ identity, whether um, the person identifies as trans and diverse and in a heterosexual relationship or whether in a same-sex relationship, is is, is extremely prominent and extremely complex in terms of trying to advocate um, with Victoria Police, but also within, um, uh, sorry, also when you're at court with the magistrates. It's, and it's, it's, a, it's a very significant issue in terms of what we're seeing com coming across um, in terms of our legal clinics. In terms of response to that, it's also considerably varied. So many of our clients will want to stay in the relationship. And so they, you know, they, they, they don't want to have or are very ashamed about the experiences of abuse that they um, have encountered within that relationship and don't want us to undertake uh, that advocacy. So it's something that uh, I think the sector is really, is really grappling with at the moment. We're doing quite a bit of work with Victoria Legal Aid, who is developing some, uh, I guess, uh, a, a piece in regards to policy advocacy for both the courts and Victoria Police, as well as the legal assistance sector, uh, to identify ways in which we can stop unnecessary criminalisation, as well as the um, impact of having intervention orders made against you when you, um, you know, when it's being used as a form of family violence in itself. Um, I think the other thing that we that is really noticeable is the lack of family violence literacy in both our clients as well as from family violence services themselves in terms of what it looks like, what are the experiences of family violence in LGBTIQ relationships. And while I don't think that's surprising to anyone, for us as legal professionals, it really changes the way that we need to work with our clients in terms of unpacking what is um, family violence and what does that look like. And it often, you know, this, it often means that you're sort of undertaking that legal education process while also undertaking the advocacy within a legal setting. What else would I want to say in terms of our experiences to date? Um, I think we're increasing our reach in terms of regional Victoria, slowly but surely. It's a really important aspect of our work. So we've had targeted uh, family violence response trainings in terms of um, 
specifically targeting uh, regional Victoria and will continue to do targeted training within regional Victoria. And, you know, part of the reason for that is because we know that most of these support services, whether statewide or not, are based in Metro Melbourne. And in addition to that, whether people identify as LGBTIQ or not, we are well aware that there are more barriers for people accessing the legal system to address family violence in regional settings. So that will be a continued part of our work over the next 18 months. I think that sums me up for this afternoon. <laughs> that was, well, look at you keeping to time, Hilary. I know. <laughs> Unexpected. <laughs> Were you wanting to um, reiterate that you are looking for um, what people in terms of resources, advice and further training um, to support LGBTIQA plus folks in the legal space who are accessing family violence um, support? Yeah, thanks, Amelia. That would be fantastic. But I'm also, you know, if anyone's got any questions, there was a lot of information in there mm -hmm. that we went through. Um, I'm very happy to take any questions from any of the participants. I think some of the questions folks had put in the chat have been answered oh. as we go, which is fantastic by, by Matt and other attendees. Okay. Wonderful. Did anyone um, within this meeting have any specific questions for Hillary to ask now? Um, certainly what I'd be keen to hear is um, whether these same details would be how we would put you, um, organizations in touch with you for accessing um, more in depth um, the training that you talked about. I think we experience a lot of family violence services who are, um, you know, either in pursuit of the rainbow tick or have acquired the rainbow tick and um, would really benefit from um, mm -hmm. hearing more uh, in how they can support the, the, the legal aspects. Mm. Yes, absolutely. So you can, you know, you can call or you can um, email us. The email address is up there. Um, yep, definitely. We're very that, responsive. Is that free of charge for, um, for you to go and provide that? Yes, it is. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Hillary will also be presenting at our upcoming LGBTQ Family Violence Forum in August, which will be happening in a few, re a few weeks. So um, if you're keen to head along to that, make sure you're subscribed to the Queer Family Violence Sector Network um, email address. We'll be sending out the program uh, next week, which is very exciting. But I'd love if you could all join together in thanking Hillary for um, sharing their time with us um, in discussing this very important topic. I know, oh, look, there's lots of little claps, Hillary. <laughs> and you're getting some fantastic um, thank yous in the chat as well. So thank you everyone for joining this afternoon at the Queer Family Violence Sector Network Service in the Spotlight event. Um, remember, if you'd like to stay up to date with future events and also our Queer Family Violence Sector Network newsletters, um, feel free to subscribe if you haven't already on the Victoria website or by emailing us at queer work uh, at latrobe.edu.au um, and we'll also send around the recording from today's uh, webinar um, as well as Hillary's contact details for those who didn't have uh, time to jot them down before they disappeared. So thank you so much everyone for joining us this afternoon um, and thank you so much Hillary. <laughs>